last talk for before the weekend. Um, I hope you're not yet too tired. Uh, right. So as in my last talk, so I have a connected reductive proof of a QP, or QP could really be any be any uh, non-Archimedean local field, but for concreteness, uh, QP. And so then last time I introduced this uh, stack bungee, which was a stack on this category of perfectoid spaces over FP bar. And it it's, was sending any such perfectoid space to the G bundles uh, on XS. <coughs> and I was discussing some of its uh, geometric properties. And then uh, on the dual side, on the Langdon's dual side, which I didn't uh, talk about last time, uh, so with there we have some prime, I fixed some prime L equal, not equal to P because I will look at some kind of L adic sheaves. Um, and uh, at some point of my talk, I need to assume that this is not too small. And I mean, in our paper, we call this very good, which sounds like a very strong condition. But I just want to point out it's really not a strong condition. So if uh, G is GLN, then this is really all L. And if G is classical in the sense that it has been used at this conference, then it uh, just means that L is not 2. So, um. <coughs> and you can also just, I mean, I'm always working with integral coefficients, ZL, and if you work with QL coefficients, you can just also for completely forget about this. So, okay. so on the dual side, we, we have the dual group G hat uh, living over ZL. And I guess it comes with its action of uh, gamma, which I recall was uh, the absolute gamma group of QP for me. Um, right, and so then, uh, Jean-Francois Dutt gave a talk this morning where he explains that there is this moduli space of L parameters. Uh, 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 which where in the end somehow denoted as some of the space of one co-cycles from, from the veil group of QP to the dual group. One co-cycles with respect to, to this action and then uh, up to G hat conjugation. And these were, I mean, I like, I like to advocate that when you do algebra, you should always replace all your topological things by condensed things anyways. And then when you do that, you, I mean, you don't have to worry about the continuity. It's to just do the obvious thing. So, yeah. um, so some of the technical problem that that spent some time discussing is somewhat just completely absent in the world of condensed mathematics. Um, and then uh, let me state a theorem that's probably discussed uh, in more detail uh, in John Francois Dutt's next, next lecture. I uh, just want to point that out. So this is some kind of reasonable scheme. Uh, it's a disjoint union, actually. Uh, and this yeah, disjoint union of uh, affine schemes of finite type over the L. It's flat and a local complete intersection. I guess even it's a complete intersection, but yeah, globally. And you can also say what its dimension is. It's dimension equal to the dimension of G, which is the dimension of G hat. I mean, dimension, relative dimension, I say. Yes. Relative over the base. Um, and throughout my talk, I will pretend uh, that this disjoint union wouldn't be there, uh, actually. Uh, right. Otherwise, there's some kind of very small technical changes I would have to make that don't really play any role. Uh, so basically, if you, if you would fix a, an open subgroup of the Wald inertia that acts trivially, this would literally be true. And then as you make this open subgroup of the Wald inertia smaller and smaller, some uh, more and more connected components arise. And okay, there's some bound ramification, so to say. It's a minor thing. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess I will sometimes just call this then spec. R. In, in using notation from John Francois Dutt's talk. Okay, so, so, so back to the 
uh, I want to talk about LRX shifts on one G. Uh, so, <coughs> I mean, one of the main constructions really in our papers is that there exists a reasonable category some kind of derived category of LRX sheaves on bungee. Um, maybe that's or it makes this part of the theorem. Uh, there exists there such a reasonable category. Um, this actually took us a l long time to really do this with CL coefficients. Uh, it's much easier if you work with C mod L to the N coefficients for some N. Uh, okay, you can also do it with CL coefficients. Um, now the passage to the L coefficients is not as easy as in algebraic geometry where you can just formally in some sense take the inverse limit over all n. Uh, in that case you would get some kind of Banach space representations of L like Banach space representations of your groups, but you don't want Banach space representations. You want just you want that Z L pretends like it's discrete. And so this it's not so easy, but it works. <coughs> Such that um, so what I said last time should be true is true, so somehow d of bun g is somehow stratified into the categories for all the strata and so the technical way to phrase that is that it's to say that it has the same orthogonal z composition uh, with some of graded pieces Drive categories on all the strata, bun G B. Uh, so there's an enumerated by the elements of uh, uh, B and B of G, which are enumerated as strata of bun G. And on each stratum, you really just get the category derived category of smooth uh, G B of Q P representations uh, over the L modules. And I will just denote, probably abbreviate this here too, dfgbqp. And I might introduce, include the coefficients or I might not. Uh, all right. Good. So um, what else? Uh, it's a nice thing. So as you. Yeah, it's all right. It's a derived category, right? So, so it better be something like a triangulated category, and let's just say triangulated. Uh, at some point, I guess it will be upgraded to this higher categorical land and become a stable infinity category. <coughs> and it's 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 one of these good guys that actually has has kind of some nice nice. Nice generating class, so it's what's called compactly generated. Uh, so this means that there is a class of objects that generates the whole category under co limits. Um, and we're homing out of these guys, well, in the stable infinity category setting, I could be, would be allowed that homing out of these commutes with all co-limits. Uh, in the triangulate setting, I have to say it commutes with all direct sums. Uh, and you can even characterize the compact objects. So an object in here is compact if and only if it has bounded support or finite support. Um, and the restriction of A to each stratum, which you then can consider as just a complex of representations, is compact. Uh, well, here it just means that it's, uh, yeah, it's basically a finitely presented object, except you might have to be slightly careful over ZL of how you say it. So. 
So the compact generators here would be to compactly induce, say, the trivial representation where k is a proper P subgroup, or prime to L at least. OK, so in representation series, there's this very important notion of a, a representation being finitely generated. Um, and so it's somehow captured by this notion of a compact object in this category. And uh, you can also translate some other things into, uh, <coughs> into uh, this uh, setting of Bungie. So for example, there's one important uh, duality on smooth representations. I'm not sure if it was talked about here at the summer school. There's a so-called Bernstein-Selevinsky duality, um, which is a self-duality of all the finitely generated representations. And this is actually also defined on, on Bungie. So uh, technically, I could say that this is what's called a self-dual guy. The category is self-dual, so there's some kind of duality functor. And this corresponds to the Bernstein-Selevinsky duality. Um, let me, I mean, these are not really relevant for the rest of the talk. Let me just also include another very important notion, uh, which is the notion of an admissible representation. And this can also be uh, 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 phrased on Bungie somehow, corresponds to a very natural notion on a sheaf. Admissible representations that correspond to the so called ULA sheaves, universally, locally, acyclic. Yeah, yeah, sorry, for all B, yeah. There's a question. I mean, is that, I mean, semi orthogonal decomposition, is that always stable for polymer? I mean, you have more adjoins. Sorry, say it again? I, I'm asking when is that uh, semi orthogonal decomposition enriches into, into a stable for polymer? I mean, you have more, more adjoins. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's somehow a split in some sense, same orthogonal decomposition. Yeah, because I mean, when you when you're on a, so the question was whether the same orthogonal decomposition somehow has some extra adjoints, and it has. Yeah, so the the strat the category needs stratum and re embeds in the big category either by J lower star or by J lower shriek functor. I have another question. I mean, whether these compact objects are also internally compact? Are the compact objects internally compact? Uh. I don't think so. I mean, this is not true at all in representation somehow because yeah. if you tensor two compact objects, then this is a huge thing. Yeah. All right. Um, so so there is a, there's a reasonable category um, uh, that somehow contains all the smooth representations that you care about. And not just for G, but f for, for example, for all of its extended pure inner forms. They're all living there together. Um, uh, and all uh, many notions from representation theory can somehow be generalized uh, to the setting of Bungie, so uh, some kind of yeah, generalized representation theory setting. Um, I mean, you should maybe point out that often when you somehow pass pass to a geometric version of something, then it's just really connected to the previous setting by some kind of analogy. But here, it's really there's literally a fully faithful functor from like the classic representation theory to this. Um, And so let me now phrase the main conjecture, uh, which is this can be regarded as a refinement of uh, this categorical local Langlands uh, conjecture that was talked about already a bit. Um, and I guess for this conjecture, I should assume that uh, uh, G is quasi-split. Uh, assume G is quasi-split. And uh, to fix the Whittaker datum. Uh, 
it's a EFG and a fixable rel. You can do that because you're in this plasma split case and it has a unipotent radical. And then you fix this non-degenerate character on this unipotent radical, which I guess can go to, well, let, let's say it goes to the vectors of L, of L bar cross S in John Francois Dutt's talk. I, I think that there, there have been some talks where it was somewhere explained that if you really want to pin down a precise local Langlois correspondence, uh, then it becomes necessary to fix Whittaker data and so on. And so the same is somewhat true here. I need to fix the Whittaker data to really write down a precise uh, local Langlois correspondence. And so the conjecture is that there then, that if you make this choice, then there exists a canonical equivalence. And sometimes people object to such formulations, but let me gloss over this. Uh, between two things. So one, one thing is the thing we, we care about. Uh, D of Bungie, uh, and now I guess I need to extend my scalars to this field. Um, let me write the other thing down here. And the other thing is uh, the bounded, ah, sorry, let me pass to the compact objects in here. That's often denoted by such an upper omega. So because this category is compactly generated, all the information is already contained in the compact objects anyways. Um, your irreducibles are in there and so on, so it's not much of an issue. Uh, and then the dual side should be the, basically the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on the, on the dual side on, um, on the stack of up parameters. Implicitly, I'm again base changing this here to, to the bit vectors of FL bar. Get some new chalk. Um, and there's a small modification I have to take here. I have to ask for, again, for this new important singular support condition that you might have seen a couple of times come up in Sam Raskin's talk. Um, let me just say that you can ignore this. if work over, if you invert L. So if you work with QL coefficients instead of ZL coefficients. <coughs> All right, that's the conjecture. So uh, this. Why, why FL bar? Are you, because you need to speak this code with a it's mostly because I need a Whittaker character, which needs all the p roots of unity. And implicitly, I guess I've probably chosen a square root of p. Maybe I didn't, because I might have chosen a different action on the g, g head. But, uh, let's say I did, but then it's also contained in there. Um, and let me just, I mean, this is pretty, like, let's just say, say, already say something about what this should do. So one thing it should do, uh, it should send the structure sh sheaf here to the Whittaker sheaf. Well, this is a condition we've seen come up a couple of times. So this is what you get by extending by zero from the stratum for, for bound one. Uh, it's a compact induction from u qp to gqp of psi, where j1, let me write this down here, j1, or generally jb will be the inclusion from some stratum into bungee. And I regard this representation here as a, as a, as a sheaf on, on, on the stratum for b equal to 1. OK? And yeah, so I should say that. Uh, uh -huh -huh -huh. As I said before, so some of this contains the category of representations of G of QP in particular, but it also includes the one for all B basic, uh, or all B. Um, but for B basic in particular, you see all the extended pure inner forms uh, appearing here. And so even if I assume that G, if, when I'm somewhat interested in the local language correspondence for a group which is not quasi splits, then you might think this conjecture doesn't say anything about that. But actually, it does, because it might still appear here 
as an extended pure inner form. And basically, you can, up to modifying the center a little bit, you can reach all, all inner forms in this way. So it really says that even if I assumed in the beginning that G is quasi split, it really says something about all, all groups. And yeah. somehow taking care of these canonical parameterizations, as in like maybe Tasha Kaleta's work, uh, how, to, how to do this for inner forms. Okay? Uh, that's the conjecture. Uh, let me contrast this with what we can prove so far. Um, the main theorem is something related but slightly different. <coughs> I, one thing you can observe in this picture here is that, I mean, this side is something where you can tensor things together. If you have two coherent sheaves, you can take that tensor product. And you might be a little bit careful with staying bounded if you take derived tensor products. Um, but basically here you can act by tensoring with things. And so you would expect that you can also act by the same category somehow on the other side. And this is what we construct. So there exists a canonical action of uh, perf. And now uh, there's this unfortunate circumstance that perfect has been used for different things. So now it means perfect complexes. Um, so these are basically like bounded coherent sheaves, except uh, you can really represent them by finite complexes of vector bundles, which is automatic if the scheme is smooth, but not otherwise. So you take the same stack, and this acts on in this rough category. I mean, this, in this case, I can even do it with the L coefficients. Um, I mean, this, this really works for all G. You don't have to. And without Whittaker datum, it's just there. And uh, if you want, you can either put the omega here, you don't, it doesn't matter. So this is known as a spectral action. OK, so this can be constructed. It's a construction, yeah. So, um, and this can be used, actually, to make this conjecture here much more precise. Maybe you can really ask that this should be uh, should be linear over this. So it should be the equivalent should be linear with respect to this action. And this basically determines this. I mean, forget about pretend this actually was smooth. So generically, this guy is smooth. So on a very large part, this doesn't make much of a difference. Then this is basically perf. And so you know where the structure chief goes. But then everything else you just get, get by acting while there's a perfect complex on it. So you know where any perfect complex goes under this equivalence. And then the conjecture is really just that this Functor that you've constructed is an equivalence of categories. All right. I should say that our paper is somehow not the, really not the first one which constructs such a spectral action. So we are really like looking at what people in geometric Langlands have done and then just translate whatever they've done. Um, so maybe the first paper that did something like this in a similar setting is this paper of Nadler and Yun on Betty geometric Langlands. And then, like these six authors, uh, Rinkin, Gatesbury, Kashtan, Ruskin, Rosenblum, Warshawski, uh, have somehow uh, explained how that argument should work in general. Um, yeah. All right, so this is uh, our main theorem, and this might look a bit abstract, so let me deduce a couple of much more concrete uh, consequences from this. Um. It's an action, right? So in particular, the unit object here should go to the unit object here. OK, so unit object is a structure chief here. The unit object here is here. I mean, it's here, it goes to the identity functor here. But it's a functor. So the endomorphisms of the unit object here should go to the endomorphisms of the identity functor here. 
it's a bit of a brain fuck, but uh, <laughs> it certainly implies that there is a canonical map uh, from, uh, from the endomorphisms of the structure sheaf. of the stack towards the endomorphisms of the identity functor on D of bungee. <coughs> what is this? Well, this is precisely the endomorphisms of the structure sheaf are precisely the global sections of the structure sheaf, which is precisely R G hat. So this appeared also in John von Sardat's talk. Uh, this here is uh, some of the Bernstein center of the category uh, of sheaves on bungee. But just because you somehow have the category of representation sitting fully faithfully inside there, it certainly maps to the Bernstein center of the group G of QP or of any of its you know, forms, whatever. But now G was general anyway, so let's not worry about this. So in particular, you get a map, as was promised in Dutt's talk, from this ring of invariant functions on the stack of L parameters towards the Bernstein center of your group. And uh, one can use this to do something even more like concrete, and which is really what we are maybe what we've maybe been setting out to do um, to construct L parameters, or at least same as simple L parameters. Uh, uh, let's say K over the L of some algebraically closed field. Uh, so basically I want to handle simultaneously the cases that K is either FL bar or QL bar. <coughs> and let's say we have an irreducible smooth representations with K coefficients. And so pi is an irreducible smooth K representation. Our group GFQP. <coughs> then we get the same as simple uh, L parameter pi pi uh, from the middle group of QP to G out of L. So that's uh, it's not a homomorphism to one core cycle in general. Uh, or you might also write as a homomorphism to the L group if you wanted. Uh, up to G out of L conjugation. Sorry, K. In our paper, we call this field L, but I thought it's confusing um, because there are also L parameters. Um, so, where is this coming from? Well, so we have this map from RG hat towards this Bernstein center, right? But the Bernstein center that acts on any representation, so it certainly maps to the endomorphisms of pi, and if pi was some k linear, there's also endomorphism over k. But by Schur's lemma, uh, this is actually k. It's actually, you don't quite need irreducible here. Sure, irreducible would be good enough. Um, so you get a map from RG hat uh, to k. So in other words, we get a k point of the spectrum of this guy. And this is really just a different, I mean, this is basically by definition, it's a coarse moduli space. So you take the space of co-cycles and then pass to the coarse quotient by g hat. <coughs> and as uh, again, that alluded to, like geometric points of such a thing, they are precisely like, same as simple conjugacy classes in here. So they're exactly same as simple uh, parameters. Uh, 
So we get a completely uniform construction of L parameters that just works for any group over any non Archimedean local field. The question was whether we can see that this L parameter is invariant under passage to the Bernstein Silvinsky dual, and uh, yes, we can see that. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's some dual that. I mean, I guess there's some expected behavior for the L parameter, and that, that works. You can also see that it's behavior. Yeah. So we prove a proposition that with many, many basic operations, it's compatible. So with passage to the smooth dual, with passage to character twists, passage to central characters, parabolic induction. Um, yeah, and some of the Torah, it's the right thing, and for GLN, it's the right thing. That's basically what we proved. So, uh, so there's, there's some of the question. Does this agree uh, with other local language correspondences? And uh, uh, I mean, it obviously should. It's obviously the right thing. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's easy to see that for Toro it's okay, and for GLN, uh, you somehow know that, uh, by somehow Harris Taylor, you know that the local language correspondence is realized in the core module of Lumintate Towers, and Lumintate Towers, they are examples of such local Shimura varieties, which Jared explained are real realized by modifications of vector bonds on the 5 10 curve, so it's very, very much in our setting, and we can use this to prove that for GLN at least we get the right thing. Um, it's also true for inner forms of GLN. Um, there the issue was that it, when, we, when some Farke and I wrote our paper, I guess it wasn't really known that for any inner form of GLN, um, the, uh, the, the, the local Langness correspondence is realized in the cohomology of some local Shimura variety. Um, it was only somehow characterized, th this local Langness correspondence, by the Jackie Langlands character identities. But then uh, Hans and Kaleta Weinstein um, proved uh, some cases of the Kotwitz conjecture. That some, uh, so in some sense, they showed that in this geometry of Bungie and on these Lucas Moore varieties, the correct character identities are realized by studying some left shift trace formula on these things. And so uh, using this, they could deduce it for inner forms of GLN. And more generally, the argument should somehow show that more or less that if you can do it for the quasi-split thing, then you can do it for inner forms. Uh, uh, there are some other isolated cases where people have done something for GSP4. Linus Harman has proved something. Um, but in general, it still seems like an open problem. It's even, I think, at the time of uh, open, whether it agrees with the construction of Genesee and LaFork in the function field case where their construction is of an extremely similar nature and you would expect you can just compare the geometry, but it's not obvious that you can do that. So. Oh. Yes, so, yes. So, so, so for G, then this means that the, the map here is the over pure in the isomorphism. Right. And so it's defined over here. Can you put it so low in the isomorphism over here? Well, I get, yeah, so the question was uh, about this map for GLN. So for GLN, Helm proved, or Helm and Moss proved that this is an isomorphism over ZL. Um, and I think one main input into the argument is really the existence of the map, yeah, which is somehow supplied by our argument. But I, 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 di I didn't check how much you can simplify the argument. So I, I don't think there's a completely formal argument that once you have the map, it's an isomorphism. But I, I didn't. I think it goes from the map the other way. So it's a Okay, I mean, if you have maps both ways and over QL there is the right thing, then obviously it's an isomorphism. So, yeah, okay. Another question. Application. I mean, uh, when you say this conjecture is true for all the inner forms of GLN, I don't think you're directly substituting that form 
continue your construction, but rather you're accessing those inner forms. Uh, yes, but okay, we proved some of that. It doesn't yeah. matter. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So that's that. Um, all right. Uh, so let me say a little bit about the construction of this uh, spectral action. Um, and let me just for simplicity assume that G is split. We went to great troubles to not doing this assumption in the paper, so. Uh, so then let me actually recall something f from Sam Raskin's talk. Um, so he was implicitly, or explicitly, I'm not quite sure, um, stating something that, uh, so here we want to construct an action of this category on something else, and we will reinterpret this in terms of some other data. He was having something where he was, uh, he wanted to construct some Drinfeld sheaf, was, which was basically a sim very similar object. So he was reinterpreting what it means to give an object in here in terms of some other data, and I want to recall that first. So in Sam Raskin's talk, uh, the following was claimed. That, uh, assume you have the following data, the data of a functor from representations of the dual group to the i to representations of like the veil version, say, of, of the pi 1 over curve. So there's no suddenly usual curve over q just for a second um, to the i. Uh, and in, in some sense, uh, functorial in a finite set i, in a set I, sense I don't want to make precise right now. So, <coughs> so why would you ever consider such data? Well, this is precisely the data that comes from the cohomology of modular space of Stukas after Kongjuice theorem. So, so, exactly the data. Uh, produced <coughs> in Kong Jue's talk. Why? So what did Kong Jue do? She, she, she fixed some finite set i, which was some parameterizing the legs, and she fixed the representation of the dual group to the i, which was given here the precise moduli space of Stuka, so it's some of the bound on the legs. And then, whenever you have such a thing, then you can write down a moduli space of Stuka, so you can take its cohomology, and then you get some sheaf on i copies of the curve, and then she was spending a lot of time showing that this is actually an int least sheaf, and so actually uh, maybe let me just not write, let me write some kind of derived category of representations of this with say q or bar coefficients. <coughs> and then she showed that actually what you're getting is just the representation of pi one whale to the i on a q or bar vector space. And then there's somehow some compatibility, some of that. If some legs collide, then it's really, again, a modular space of Stukas with one leg less. And then uh, the cohomology doesn't actually change. So this is what's encoded in this uh, functor reality I didn't specify. <coughs> and then the theorem is that this is actually the same amount of data as an object, a, quasi a complex of quasi coherent sheaves on uh, like the stack of L parameters. So the homomorphisms from the veil group to the dual group. And so. so you get this drift here. And the thing it's somehow characterized by is that uh, if you apply this functor to any representation V, then this would be the same thing as taking the global section. So let me write this R gamma 
on the stack of the Drinfeld sheaf tensored with V applied to the universal representation. So in other words, you can get the cohomology of all the modular space of Stukas, which is exactly what's encoded in this, these funny functors, in terms of taking this funny sheaf Drinf and tensor it with some. So this, this was a formula that appeared at the end of this talk just when I was empty, so you just get the space of automorphic forms here and you can forget about this factor. And that was also more or less appearing in uh, Matt Emerton's talk uh, in some analog for Shimura varieties. And then some of the extra thing he said was that this guy should act shouldn't actually be just some random sheaf, but then some of the extra input he claimed was that this should actually be just a dualizing complex of, of the stack. Okay, but anyway, so there's this translation between constructing something on the stack of L parameters and uh, having such, such amounts of data. Okay, and so the similar thing will be true for us. So there's, uh, oops. So here's a theorem. So here's a theorem that, again, is from my paper with Fark now. Um, <coughs> so this is a theorem that, so we work quite hard to do this with ZL coefficients and is in this theorem some of the assumption that L is very good uh, comes in. So let's say we have some, well, I guess I have to say the word ZL linear stable infinity category now. Uh, so this in the application this will just be some of this D of 1G. Um, uh, idempotent complete, yes. So whenever you have an idempotent endomorphism of an object, uh, you can uh, split split the object accordingly to the idempotent. <coughs> and so it probably will be the maybe the compact objects in there. Um, never mind. Uh, so then, giving an action. of this category of perfect complexes. Well, I guess now that I, my group is split, this is really just homomorphisms. Um, on C is equivalent to giving uh, well, let me not erase the main theorem and the main conjecture. finite sets i <coughs> an action of the category of rep g head to the i so that's uh, as, as here so the representation over zero um, so these will actually be the the ones on finite projective modules so there's some rather concrete category um, on the endomorphisms, uh, so it maps to the endomorphisms of C, but you don't actually want just an endomorphism, but it should also be a representation of your group to the I is somewhere here. So you want some, uh, let me just write, to the WQP to the I. So this means WQ to the I equivariant uh, objects. So any, any V in here maps to some TV, which is from C and to C, but actually it doesn't just go to C because it's equivariant, so it actually gives you WQP to the I equivariant objects. And so this should be in, what should to satisfy, this should be exact 
uh, ZL linear and monoidal. <coughs> and you take all this data and then you have to say it's functorial in I. So this is the data you have to produce. Um, why should you ever be able have to produce such data? Well, like <coughs> you want to have the category of perfect complexes on here acting. But this is a quotient stack. So in particular, it maps to like the point mod she had, and there the like in particular the vector bonds are the representations of G check. So if you have a representation G check, you can pull it back to the stack and then act. And this is basically what this would do if you just have uh, one V. But okay, you should also be able to do this if you tensor a few of them together. But the point is that it should actually be come from here. And over here, these vector bonds suddenly get new endomorphisms, so are basically given by this algebra R. And these new endomorphisms are in some sense precisely encoded by getting this extra variable group equivariance here. Okay. Sorry, how are I talking to Just trivially. They act trivially on here. So it's just, it's just an ob, so this category is just the category of an object on, in here plus, a, plus an action of the variable group. Very group to the eye. Uh, let me not try to worry about what, uh, what the function area in I is because I would get confused. But uh, I mean, here and here the model I is just a standard representation, right? And it goes to the identity and the functor here. Well, this is a monoidal category, and so you can take limits in monoidal categories. So. <laughs> um, okay, so and so, how do we construct this? So, in construction. Is that? TV is, is just such a hack operator as they always exist in geometric Langlands, and I will come back to this in just a second how they are constructed. So basically, in geometric Langlands, using hack operators, you always have these functors from here to here to some I copies of your curve. And then in here, you have a full subcategory where in the curve directions, the sheaf doesn't actually change. Uh, so instead of like a varying sheaf, you somehow the sheaf is always constant, but when you pass around a loop in your in your curve, uh, you pick up a monodic representation. So some of the vague group and yeah. Pi one of your curve of the Falk von Ten curve is some of the vague group of QP. Um, <coughs> so if you're locally constant in the curve direction actually land then in this category. And so uh, the claim is that these hack operator actually they always factors through here, and so these are your hack operators. Okay. Uh, this will be how we do it. Um, right. So, so let me be more precise. So, so. Structures to use hack operators. So let me actually uh, come back now again to a rather concrete example. 
so let's assume that uh, let's say we offer only one leg. Uh, let's also say that the group is just GL2. So the dual group is also GL2. And uh, V is just a standard representation. Uh, then th you can actually write down the hack operator. So then here we have the stack of rank two vector bundles. Let me just write this as bun two. Um, then over this you have some hacker stack, which uh, would in principle depend on all the decorations, but let me just not write the decorations. Um, and this should map to bun two times the curve. And I said previously the curve doesn't exist, so uh, this is a bit fishy and I will explain what I should actually write there. Um, but let me first write down what uh, the hacker stack is. So it parameterizes two vector bundles, well, the two projections, um, a point of the curve and the map. Uh, so E and E prime are uh, rank two vector bundles. X the point of the curve and uh, be more precise in a second. And f uh, is a modification of these two vector bundles. So it should be an isomorphism away from this point x. And, uh, and then it should have a prescribed behavior at the point x, which is uh, encoded in the standard representation, choice of the standard representation here. And it act actually just gets these very simple uh, modifications where you just get an embedding of vector bundles, e to e prime, uh, where the co kernel is a, is a degree one skyscraper sheaf at x. So if I say take, let's try to analyze this, if I really just take the fiber product here over a point, uh, given by the trivial bundle O squared. <coughs> then what I really have to give here is a point of the Fock von 10 curve. But recall the points of the Fock von 10 curve, they were really parameterized by untils. So um, let me, okay, let me just call this here H, um, the fiber product. So H, so what should it actually parameterize? So it parameterizes points of the Falk von 10 curve, but uh, these were untils uh, up to Frobenius. That's sharp. Plus uh, a modification of the trivial rank two bundle there. And so the, to determine this modification, you really just have to understand what happens in the fiber here. And then there's really just some uh, given, you have this rank two bundle here and then you're modifying this at one place. So this is really just given by a line. So plus a point of P1 over uh, the untilt. And so more precisely actually, well, what parameterizes untilts? Param what parameterizes this untilt is bar QP diamond, well, modular Frobenius. And then, actually, it's a P1 over that, if you think about it. Uh, some Let me write it as this thing. Uh, so H maps to this thing, and the fibers are P1s. <coughs> and well, this thing, this is not the Fark von Tenker, this is something different. But it's actually what parameterizes relevant data. So this thing here is actually, we denote this by diff one. It's the thing that parameterizes like degree one divisors and it's actually this thing that you have to put here. So that's a bit confusing that on the Fark von 10 curve, the thing that parameterizes points on the Fark von 10 curve is not the Fark von 10 curve itself. It's something slightly different, which looks very similar and it's called diff one. Um, but it doesn't actually make it much of a difference for what I said before, so for example, Yeah, so if it's not already over 
FP bars and I should base change it. So I should really write div1 to the i here. And it's still true that pi1 of div1 is a Weyl group. Because implicitly, I guess, because everything here was F over fp bar, I should also base change this here from fp to fp bar. Uh, and so in this sense, this should be qp variable. And then, I mean, the fundamental group here, this would just be inertia. And then you have this extra Frobenius here, so you get the Weyl group of qp. OK, so <laughs> if you actually fix a point here, Fix an untilt here, also. Um, then uh, the common fiber product here would just be a P1 over CP, which parameterizes the modifications and maps to the Hecke stack. And then, so you can modify the trivial rank two bundle by something in P1 and get a new vector bundle. And then there's actually some kind of interesting geometry where. Uh, you somehow see two strata, and P1 of QP maps to the line vec vector bundle O plus O of 1. And, and the complement maps to, the complement is called Drinfeld's upper half space omega 2. So it's, it's not an algebraic variety or anything, right? It's a complement of this profinite set inside here. Uh, this maps to the vector bundle O of a half. And this actually gives you some kind of chart of Bantu. So, so far, we, Bantu was something extremely stacky for us, right? But now you actually get some sensible geometric objects mapping to Bantu. And then you see that the strata of Bantu, they're actually kind of some kind of pretty wild geometric objects because suddenly this P1 got stratified into a profinite set in its complement. So, the geometry of this stack is really rather, rather wild somehow. Uh, anyway, so. This would give you one example of a hacker operator. You t start with a sheaf here, pull it back to the hacker stack, and then push forward here. And then you get a sheaf on bun two times, well, this, this, this thing that's still just one point, really, right? I mean, this is not a curve. It just has one point. Like, it's just, it's just a field. And so it turns out that in this sense, if you just apply a hacker operator for one leg, a, you don't actually have a choice but to be locally constant in this direction because there's anyways only one point. And so this inclusion there is actually just an equality, and so you automatically get the factorization. Um, so this is much easier than in geometric Langlands, where the curve is a curve, and you actually have to prove that something is locally constant. Here, your curve is uh, still a point. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm out of time already, so let me stop. Any question? There are no perverse sheep in this problem. I, there are perverse sheep. Uh, let me get down this other board. So maybe one thing I sh should have said is that, <coughs> like if you, like here we were looking at the simplest kinds of modifications of vector bundles, and so you can consider more general mo modifications of vector bundles. So, uh, for example, you get some, you can look at the moduli space of modifications of the tri of the trivial G bundle. So this is the, the Efren Grassmannian in our setting. And um, so this Efren Grassmannian, well, you can somehow take its, I don't know, CP points or something. So because you need to specify where this modification should happen, you somehow need to specify an untold, and uh, this I just did. Um, and then this is given by taking the so-called beta ram points of G and divide out by the G beta ram plus points of G, where beta ram plus is a traditional Pierre de Koch theory name for taking the Falk von 10 curve and then 
CP gives you a point on that, and you can take the complete local ring at that point. Because it's a curve, this should be a complete DVR, and it is. And uh, beta ROM is its fraction field. <coughs> so this is something that's also called the beta ROM fine Grassmannian because it's some, uh, yeah, given by this Fontaine construction of this beta ROM period ring. Uh, so you can also write this as an LG CP. G plus of CP, where LG uh, plus G is some of this thing, and LG is kind of this thing. Um, and then there is again a geometric Sartaki equivalence. So you can define uh, perverse sheaves on this F and Grassmannian, at least L plus G equivalent ones. And these are equivalent to representations of the dual group. And this is actually what the dual group is. <laughs> I mean, when I first learned about Langlands, I was always totally confused what the dual group is. Where does it come from? I mean, it's just some ad hoc construction, and then, okay, you can translate some semi simple conjugacy classes from one group to the another, and then it somehow works, but where does it really come from? And it comes from geometric satake. Um, so when you want to define these hack operators here, you can look at the stack of such modifications of G bundles uh, in large generality, but then you want to pull back, but then you want to tensor by something here to make it some, uh, have bounded support and so on, and then push down again. So you need to tensor with some reasonable thing up here. And so the things that you should tensor by are some of the things that only depend on what the modification locally looks like. So it should be precisely sheaves on this Grassmannian, and so on to make everything well defined, there must be a plus G equivalent. It turns out that then the right ones are to consider are the perverse ones. Um, and they turn out to be equivalent as a tensor category to the representations of the dual group. And so this gives you a construction of the dual group. Yeah? So you can operate and endow this with a maximum to Nakian category and get a construction of some group scheme over, over ZL in this case. And then you can just identify which group scheme it is and you see it is a dual group. And so someone also canonically on here acting, you have the Galois group. So canonically acting on here, you also get the Galois group. And then it turns out that this is the usual action of gamma on the dual group, except not quite as a cyclotomic twist. And so this actually also explains the C group that appears sometimes, because actually the usual action of the dual group is not the right one. You should do a cyclotomic twist in it. And then this is the one that actually appears in geometry. You can usually trivialize it by, for example, choosing a square root of p, but in this case. But so on. Choosing a square root of the cyclotomic character, you can trivialize it. And you can also define perverse sheaves on Bungie if you wanted to. But um, there's probably not a completely general notion, but for the most important things, you can define what the perverse sheaves are. Yeah. Yeah. A little more about the one versus the curve. But I mean, a priori, it looks like this is like the absolute part of that curve. It's not living over any perfect right? Right. Uh, except, I mean, so the, ah, right, the question. So uh, the difference between div one and the Falk von Ten curve. Um, you see, div one, uh, you're modding out by the Frobenius of QP, uh, which doesn't really make any sense. But actually, when you tilt it, this when you pass through the diamond, it actually acquires a Frobenius as everything someone characters be as a Frobenius. So you can divide by the Frobenius of QP. So this kind of guy it doesn't actually even live over Spark QP anymore. So. And it's, it's also just a diamond. It's not, uh, it's not an addict space of a QP or anything. So it's, they live in kind of different worlds. One is an addict space of a QP, or it's many, many of them, because for any kind of C you can build one, or for any S you can build one. The other is just one fixed diamond that lives in, yeah, in characteristic P only, really, because you've suddenly divided by a Frobenius of QP, which is a bit weird. One more question. Yeah. Oh, the question, why, why was div1 the correct thing to put uh, there in the map? Right? The question was why div1 occurs? Yeah, in the map. Right, right I mean, you, you need to specify where. <coughs> uh, yeah, let, let's actually make this a little more precise what's actually happening here, right? So. Uh, I was somehow 
giving the impressionistic sketch and then one lose track of where objects actually live. So this E and E prime, like what are the s-valued points? So these are vector bundles, rank two in this case, over the far frontend curve X, xs. <coughs> and now I want to somehow say, basically say an isomorphism, uh, when you restrict to xs minus one point, so I guess I should sum a minus one point beats minus uh, an untilled s sharp in this case. Right, because we saw that if you have an untilled s sharp, then we can actually embed this canonically into ys and then project to xs. So what we need to give ourselves in order to say that, well, it's basically giving an untilled of s. But what parameterizes untilts of s? Well, it was spark QP diamond more or less by definition. So we need to we need to take a map to spark QP diamond, and then well, because we don't actually need to map to ys, but only to x, is actually good enough to have it modular for Venus. So somehow when I say I want to somehow specify the point where this uh, co-kernel is supported, if you actually think about what this actually means, you don't actually give a point of the Fark von 10 curve because there is even not the Fark von 10 curve, so this sense wouldn't even make sense, but instead you really have this kind of funny div 1 occurs. Uh, so Fark likes, likes to call this a mirror curve. And it's called div1 because, I mean, for any, for any d, you can div classify degree d Cartier divisors. So there's also some div d's, but. OK, thank you.